Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to welcome you all to the first online seminar for this academic year. And it's going to be also the first seminar from the project of the Department of International Relations at the National Research University, Higher School of Economics, and the Bulgarian Club at the university, uh, the European integration and Eastern European aspect uh, that is uh, supervised by Professor Alexander Lukin, uh, where in few lectures, we will try to present the most, the most pressing issues of the European Union uh, from the Green Deal to matters of security and uh, the establishment of, a, for example, a European army. Uh, my name is Stefan Stianov, and I am the vice chairman of the Bulgarian Club, and I'm going to be today's host. Uh, today's topic is going to be uh, something like a starting point, because we need to know the current situation in the European Union and what are, what are the perspectives for uh, future integration? For example, is Europe really moving towards the creation of uh, something like United States of Europe? And uh, in this line of thought, I'm very happy to present our first speaker uh, who was born and uh, studied in Bulgaria, but currently is a professor in one of the most prestigious uh, universities in the United States, the George Washington University, Theodore Christoph. Uh, he acquired his BA in liberal arts from Thomas uh, Aquinas College in California. Uh, he then received an MTS degree uh, from Harvard University and a PhD in political science from UCLA in 2008. After that, uh, he was visiting assistant professor of political theory at Northwestern University, where he uh, was also a faculty affiliate at Alice Kaplan Institute uh, for the Humanities. And since uh, 2011, he has been teaching in the Department of History at Georgetown, George Washington University. Uh, he's also a faculty affiliate at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Elliott School of International Relations and serves on the Faculty Advisory Committee uh, of the Peace Studies Program. His research interests lie in the field of intellectual history, particularly 17th and 18th century, and a modern political and international thought, the history of international law and classical theories of international relations. He is the author of Before Anarchy, Hopes and His Critics in Modern International Thought, published by Cambridge University Press in 2015, which examines European debates over the external relations of states in the works of Hobbes, Pufendorf, and Feitel, and how these early modern debates have been dehistorized in contemporary international relations. Dear Christoph, was also a 2015 Clerk Fellow at the John W. Clerk Center at the Library of US Congress, where he focused on a book length study uh, of the creation of states since the 19th century and the parallel emergency of international law. He, was, he has also published on hopes and international thoughts, uh, Veto and the lab, uh, Liberal State, and the Federal Idea of Early Modern Europe. And now uh, let's let's not waste more time. I'm very happy to, to give the floor uh, to our lecturer today, uh, Theo Christoph, and I'm going to share the screen of his presentation. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Stefan. Здравейте на всички. Добре вечер, ночен приятна. I will um, conduct the presentation in English to all of you. And um, thank you so much in advance to Stefan for sharing the screen. I'm unable to do so. Um, I have about 20 slides or so um, that he'll be um, sharing while I'm uh, speaking. Um, I plan to speak for about 50 minutes. I'm happy to open it up for Q&A afterwards, and then we can have a conversation. Um, let me just um, um, share some of the main points that um, I have um, for you tonight. Um, if you go to the next slide, I can um, share some of the uh, contents um, um, with uh, you about the presentation. So the European Union, kind of a general overview, 
um, is a political and economic partnership that represents a unique form of cooperation among sovereign states. It is the latest stage in a process of European integration that began after World War II, initially by six European countries to promote peace and economic recovery um, with the eventual 27 countries that we have today, including former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Now we can move to the next slide. Uh, this one, overview. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think it's the third slide. We have some kind of technical issue. Uh, Stefan, restart the share screen. So what, what are you seeing at the moment? The head slide. Uh, okay, so at the moment I am in overview. You don't see third slide. Mm -hmm. So let me share it again. Uh, I, I, I suppose yeah. it's important. Yeah, uh -huh. everything's fine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, my, yes, that's wonderful. Um, so if you look at this map, you will see this historical development, um, how the EU has been built through a series of binding treaties and has characteristics of both a supranational entity um, as well as an intergovernmental organization. Over the years, member states have sought to harmonize laws and adopt common policies on an increasing number of issues. And if you go to the next slide, you will see the differentiated, um, um, uh, you will see some of the core institutions that support the European Union. If you go to the next slide. I am on the next slide, actually. Okay, uh -huh. okay so let's do it like this. I'm just not going to for the slideshow. Uh -huh. This one, I suppose. Yes. Okay. So you will see some of the core institutions that on which the European Union has been built um, and what is their governance uh, role. Also, what the body that composes each of these uh, institutions, the most important of these are obviously the European Council, the European Commission, the Council of the European Union um, and the European Parliament and the Court of Justice. So in many ways, these can be seen as the core supporting entities of the European uh, Union, which is not to say that every single member um, is equally integrated into the European Union. And if we go to the next slide, we will see a differentiated level of, uh, thank you, uh, integration within the European Union. Um, EU members share a, co a, a common customs union, a single market in which goods, services, and people, and capital, the four um, um, freedoms, which are commonly known, known within the European Union, um, they share a common uh, trade policy, a common agricultural policy, a common currency, the euro, um, which is used by 19 member states known collectively as the Eurozone. Now, 22 EU members and four non-EU members participate in the Schengen area of the free movement of people, which allows individuals to travel without passport checks. In addition, the EU has taken steps to develop common foreign and security policies and has sought to build common internal security measures. Perhaps the most challenging um, moment for the EU came with uh, Brexit, which happened in June of 2016 with a very small margin of uh, less than 2% British voters favored uh, leaving the European uh, Union. Uh, this negotiation has been uh, protracted for a very long time. It has uh, formally concluded, but informally there are still negotiations that are um, going on. Now, in addition, as I'm going to uh, uh, share in just a little bit, the European Union faces a number of other salient uh, challenges. These include addressing concerns about democratic backsliding, in some member states, including Hungary and Poland, 
managing migra uh, migration pressures and integration of newcomers, dealing with a resurgent Russia, and obviously combating a heightened uh, terrorism threat. Now, despite Brexit, the other 27 members of the European Union at least appear committed to sustaining the EU and are considering further European Union uh, reforms. In the longer term, um, some even suggest that the EU is likely to face a fundamental choice between supporting further integration as a solution to the bloc's uh, um, woes and those who contend that integration in fact has gone too far and it should be put on hold at least for the moment. So the more of the EU or um, the EU as it is. So these seem to be the two main uh, propositions. Now let me turn to um, the next slide and share something with you about the past as a prologue. Um, and to share with you um, in that uh, section, the different waves of integration. So if you move to the next, if we move to the next slide, you will see the overall historical development from the 1950s all the way to uh, the present day. It all started in 1951 with Belgium, the Federal Republic of uh, Germany, France, Italy, Luxembourg, <clears throat> and the Netherlands. They all established European coal and steel community, which in many ways was the first step in the European integration project. This was envisioned as a single economic market in which sovereignty over coal and steel would be pulled and production controlled by an independent supranational uh, authority. Obviously, this has moved significantly since 1951. It began operations, this European community, coal and steel community, it started operations, operations in 1952. And over the next five years, it uh, uh, increased from um, um, uh, trade among these original six members increased um, more than 130%. Subsequent in 1973, with the entry of the UK, Ireland, Denmark, um, the Union expanded, followed by 1981, Greece, and then after the end of the dictatorship in Spain and Portugal, uh, and they joined in 1986. The creation of the European uh, Act, Single European Act of 1987, facilitated the creation of a single uh, uh, European-wide market and ultimately resulted in the mostly free movement of the four freedoms, goods, people, capital, and services. So obviously with the end of the Cold War, there was a massive transformation. We added Austria, Finland, and Sweden in 1995, but enlargements did expand to Central and Eastern Europe. And this was one of the most um, wonderful successes of the end of the Cold War that sort of culminated in 2004 with eight former communist countries, including the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia, all of which joined the European Union, along with Cyprus and Malta. And it was in 2007, Bulgaria and Romania joined, um, followed by Croatia in 2013. Now, if we go to the next um, slide, I wanted to focus a little bit on uh, some of the lingering concerns um, within the European Union. Those have to do with the 2008-2009 global recession that significantly had uh, an economic impact on the European Union um, at large. And the subsequent Eurozone debt crisis sparked concerns about the fundamental structure and the viability of the 19-member Eurozone. Um, uh, to... Uh, I'm going to, yes, uh, so do not turn your microphones, please. You may continue. Yes, so the 2008-2009 global recession significantly impacted the European Union um, in economic uh, terms. Some EU governments, as you recall, imposed very unpopular austerity measures in an effort to rein in budget deficits and public debt. To stem the Eurozone crisis, the European leaders and the EU institution responded with a variety of policy uh, mechanisms. To avoid default, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Cyprus received financial assistance from the IMF, and the Eurozone crisis also put pressure on Europe's banking system, leading to the collapse of insolvent banks in several countries 
and an EU recap uh, recapitalization plan for Spanish banks. Now, this also economic um, uh, uh, crisis gave rise to a political crisis. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the rise of anti-EU or Eurosceptic political parties. Um, I'm not very exhaustive in terms of every single EU country. Um, there's variation with each of those. But by and large, over the last several years, many European Union countries have seen a rise in support uh, for populist um, or nationalist, anti-establishment, if you will, political uh, parties. They're oftentimes terms Eurosceptic uh, because many have also been fueled by wars that too much national sovereignty has been relinquished to Brussels. Although not a completely new phenomenon within the European Union, the uptick in support for such parties largely began in response to Europe's economic difficulties starting in 2008, 2009. Populist and Eurosceptic parties, however, are not monolithic. And this is sort of a central point I want to uh, emphasize. Most are on the far right on the political spectrum, but a few of them are actually on the far left, um, or at least on the left. The degree of Euroscepticism also varies very widely uh, among all of them, um, but by and large, um, they are skeptical of European Union integration and expansion. While some advocate for EU reforms and a looser European Union in which member states retain greater sovereignty, others, on the other hand, call for an end to the Eurozone or even an end to the EU itself. Austria, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Spain, and Sweden are among those EU countries with largely prevalent populist, but to some extent, Eurosceptic uh, parties. Um, even in 2014, we have some members in the European Parliament who entered uh, on a Eurosceptic uh, platform. Um, in Denmark, for example, a minority government relies on a Eurosceptic party to provide parliamentary support. As we recall in 2017 in Germany, anti-immigrant and Eurosceptic alternative for uh, Germany, the AFD party, uh, which is largely anti-immigrant, Eurosceptic, uh, but it did provide support in the federal um, elections in 2017, and that support was pivotal uh, for them to enter parliament something we have not seen since the end of World War II. And such Eurosceptic parties are challenging the general pro-European establishment parties and have put pressure on mainstream leaders to embrace some of their own positions. The UK's government's decision to hold in June of 2016 public referendum on continued EU membership was largely driven by pressure from hardline Eurosceptics both within but also outside of the governing conservative party. Some Eurosceptic parties may hope to influence the formation of EU policies um, um, and affect the further European Union integration process. At the same time, opinion polls indicate that the majority of EU citizens remain largely supportive of uh, membership in the EU. There are many different polls, um, but by and large, many of them about two thirds, 68% or so of the respondents believe that their country has benefited from being within the European Union. Some even have noted um, that uh, in 2017, um, the elections in France, for instance, um, led to um, the uh, more radical extreme parties um, pro um, uh, nationalist, the National Front to uh, come to the forefront of the political uh, process. Um, now, if we uh, move on to the next slide, I want to share with you something about um, the lack of uh, strong leadership and decreased solidarity, which I think is one of the cracks in the stability of the European Union. Historically, the development of the European Union has been driven forward largely by several key countries acting as, in many ways, are called the engine, uh, namely France and Germany. And this French-German leadership has been seen as fundamentally essential in establishing the common currency. Um, but in many ways, France and the UK um, were instrumental in forging uh, common European uh, um, security policies. Some people even suggest that um, 
even though that we have this strong European Union engine, over the last several years, it has been lacking um, in its um, uh, uh, strength. Although the outgoing German Chancellor uh, Merkel has played a central role in responding to this Eurozone uh, crisis over the last decade or so, we have seen Russian aggression in the Ukraine, for instance, um, migrant uh, flows into and refugees into Europe. All of these um, moments have exacerbated the unity of uh, the EU. Um, now, if we move on to the next slide, I want to share some of the simultaneous um, challenges that um, um, remain um, uh, for us today. Obviously, this is uh, what I referred to uh, as Brexit in 2016. And I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this UK decision to leave the EU. The large message that I want to drive at here is that even though that has been an, a misfortune uh, largely um, uh, for the European Union, it is also an opportunity. Um, so I think it's important for us to look at the Brexit crisis as an opportunity as well. Now, the UK has long been considered one of the most Eurosceptical members of the EU. This is really no news. Uh, many British leaders and citizens alike have been very cautious of ceding too much sovereignty to Brussels. And there are many historical reasons um, for that. As a result, the UK uh, chose to remain outside of the Eurozone and the Schengen free movement area. And it was able to negotiate the right to participate in only selected justice and home affairs policies. So a lot of concessions were in fact given to Britain. Amidst the challenges of the EU over the last few years, the former UK prime minister, David Cameron, faced growing pressures from hardliners within his own country, both uh, also within the Conservative Party, but also outside of the Conservative Party. And in response, the Cameron government uh, did, I think, one of the um, gravest mistake, uh, mistakes ever, which uh, uh, when it announced that it would renegotiate the UK's membership uh, conditions with the EU and to hold out, uh, hold simply in or out public referendum on UK's continued membership in the EU. Referendum and European integration has have always been on two different um, opposite sides of the spectrum. So the assumption that somehow referendum, uh, referendums in general drive European integration, I think it's uh, quite misleading. Uh, and the UK Brexit situation points to that. So as we all recall in February of 2016, Cameron reached a deal with other EU governments on measures that would um, seek to guard better British sovereignty and the economic interests um, of the UK within uh, the EU. So many of us remember the dark day, June 23rd of 2016, when the outcome of the referendum uh, was determined with a very small margin, 51.9 versus 48.1 in favor of leaving the European Union. This was a moment, I think, of sobriety, both for the EU, but also for EU, um, not only uh, leaders, but also the average EU citizen to ponder on what is the future of the European uh, Union. And I think there are several factors that, were that sort of heavily influenced um, the outcome of Brexit, including economic dissatisfaction, uh, not unlike what we also have seen in 2016 here in the United States, fears about globalization, immigration, and also um, sort of almost global at this moment, anti-elite and anti-establishment sentiments. EU leaders maintain that the union of 27, down from 28 members, will continue, but the departure of a member state, in fact, of a major uh, uh, member state is unprecedented in EU's history. And in that uh, sense, sort of the fallout of that European Union departure of the UK uh, is unprecedented uh, and we still live, uh, and I think for a long time, we will live with those political and economic repercussions. Some have even suggested that uh, given the UK's foreign policy cloud and defense capabilities, Brexit is going to diminish the EU's role as an international actor. I myself do not subscribe to that uh, position, but it is uh, quite prevalent. Um, uh, at the same time, there are other voices um, that argue that Brexit could ultimately lead to a more like-minded European Union. Now that you have um, 
uh, Britain out, uh, you are going to um, attain a deeper integration uh, uh, within the EU. For example, Brexit could strengthen the prospects for a closer EU defense cooperation because the UK traditionally has served as a break on certain measures in this area. The UK typically sought to circumscribe EU initiatives that the um, uh, to, uh, to circum the UK typically sought to circumscribe EU initiatives that the UK viewed as infringing too much on their national sovereignty, uh, and in fact, on NATO's role in European uh, security. So by and large, um, I would say Brexit is an opportunity as opposed to an irresolvable uh, crisis. Now, next slide, um, and I want to kind of share some thoughts that I have that are quite pertinent to many of us um, coming from um, the Eastern European, Central European uh, context, democracy and the rule of law. And these are deep concerns that have grown over the last few years about what many EU officials and observers view as what we call democratic backsliding in a number of member states. Um, even though I have a couple of them in mind, including Poland and Hungary, um, overall, I want, I'm going to share sort of larger views on um, uh, other members um, as well. We can move on to the next uh, slide um, to share some interesting concerns um, about Poland and Hungary, um, going back to 2015 with the uh, 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 ruling conservative nationalist Law and Justice Party uh, in Poland. Um, many uh, voices, have come up to contend that there has been an erosion of checks and balances, not only in Poland, but also in Hungary under the uh, premiership of Viktor Orban uh, and his conservative nationalist Fidesz uh, party. Uh, that has been in power since 2010. Um, um, some, of, uh, some experts continue in fact to worry that EU tensions with Poland and with Hungary, in fact, are not unique, but to those uh, countries, but in fact reflect broader divisions within uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, both Poland and Hungary, uh, at least at the elite level, appear skeptical of further EU integration in some policy fields, including migration. Um, and they argue that they're being, these countries, um, uh, Poland and Hungary specifically, that they're being unfairly targeted uh, for their views on the purpose and union uh, and future shape of the European Union bloc. Um, in fact, Prime Minister Orban has contended that the initiation of Article 7 uh, proceedings is sort of what he calls Brussels revenge for Hungary's hardline towards uh, migrants. And we see a variation of this actually playing out now between uh, Poland and Belarus. Um, so th this is sort of one concern about backsliding of uh, uh, um, the reforms that we have seen, uh, but also there are other pressures coming from uh, migration. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes sharing some of uh, uh, those and have identified sort of three broad uh, uh, pressures um, over migration. Over the last few years, um, partly because of uh, war uh, and conflict in Syria and the Middle East more broadly, as well as the North African continent, Europe has experienced significant migrant and refugee flows. People are trying to flee uh, from uh, poverty and uh, civil war um, from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Asia, um, but also from uh, North Africa, including Sudan and Ethiopia uh, and Eritrea. The EU has faced subsequently considerable criticism for lacking of coherent, effective migration and asylum policy. And those have been very difficult uh, to forge, partly because national sovereignty concerns seem to kind of uh, come up to the surface, as well as sensitivities about minorities, about integration and uh, EU identity, whatever that may mean. And I'll spend some time later in my presentation to address that. Now, despite the overall reduction in migrants and refugees, especially since 2015, when there was a height, um, currently, um, what we're seeing is um, that there has been some reining in of uh, those uh, flows that still continue in um, very important um, uh, sort of ways. But I want to stress three distinct um, challenges. The first one is challenges to EU solidarity. 
Um, what we have seen through this migrant and refugee flows is an exposure of some deep divisions within the European Union. Uh, frontline states, including Greece, Italy, uh, to some extent Bulgaria, uh, have been seen as key destination countries uh, for those fleeing uh, conflict. Uh, but other European Union countries complain that authorities in those frontline countries are often lax about registering new arrivals properly, enabling many of them to leave and to seek asylum elsewhere. So I think this is a major crack within uh, Europe, the lack, the absence of uh, a single coherent policy on refugee and asylum. The second one is threats to the Schengen area of free movement. We have seen um, just over the last few years um, how uh, some of the core members of the European Union have allowed the um, bringing back of uh, border control. And this migra migration and refugee flows have put strains on uh, the Schengen area, uh, which in many ways is regarded as one of the core freedoms. Remember the freedom of movement of people. The area uh, largely depends, the Schengen area, on confidence in the security of the external borders of the EU. Um, Schengen has been tested not only by the magnitude of the migration flows, but also by concerns that some terrorists may have been able to slip into Europe as kind of part of that uh, flow. In fact, in 2015, some Schengen countries, including Germany and Austria, instituted temporary border controls in some part of their areas as a response to that migration flow. Uh, and these temporary controls remain in effect, and some experts worry that repeated extensions could make them permanent. And finally, the third um, concern is sort of this renewed concern about integrating minorities. Um, it's a large topic I don't have time to go into, but the influx of refugees and migrants uh, have sort of rekindled questions about the European Union's ability to integrate minorities into European culture um, and uh, society. Now, what about the security concern for the European Union? Over the past several years, the EU has struggled with how best to address significant changes in, European, in Europe's security environment. The most prominent of these concerns relate to the ongoing conflict in the Ukraine, uh, where a more military assertive uh, uh, Russia uh, seems to present certain challenges. Um, and these uh, issues have challenged the EU's ability uh, to forge a common foreign and security uh, policy. Um, so let me turn to my next uh, slide. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes to something that might be of interest to our audience, how to manage a resurgent uh, Russia. Like the United States, the EU has been uh, forced to reconsider in many ways its relationship with uh, a resurgent uh, Russia and to kind of try to reformulate um, its own security uh, policy uh, in light of uh, its stability. The EU, uh, as we know, has sought to support Ukraine's political transition. Um, it has condemned Russia's annexation of Crimea of 2014, and has strongly urged Russia to stop backing separatist forces in Eastern Ukraine. The EU has worked both to engage with the Russian President Vladimir Putin in promoting a political solution um, which, by the way, is the only solution here. There is no military solution to the conflict, but also to impose certain uh, uh, series of sanctions uh, on uh, Russia. Beyond the Ukraine, the EU and many member states are concerned about a range of other Russian activities, including disinformation efforts and potential election interference in Europe. And we have seen this in, at least in the US in 2016 election, uh, and interference uh, coming from uh, Russia, but also Russian actions in Syria, cyber threats, um, and alleged human rights um, abuses. So um, at the same time, there are some fundamental differences that exist within uh, uh, EU about how to manage Russia in the long term. And I think this is kind of the key, the long term as opposed to the uh, short term. Uh, some still hope that Russia can be seen as a partner for the EU, and they maintain that Russia um, uh, is too big to kind of isolate or to ignore, and that ultimately Europe's stability and security depend on forging strong relations uh, with Moscow. Many EU countries have extensive commercial ties with uh, Russia, Germany, Italy, for instance, 
and they rely on Russia to help uh, meet their own oil and gas needs, especially if you focus on some of the Eastern European countries. Um, some European policymakers argue that Russian cooperation is um, essential in resolving many conflicts, including the ongoing conflict um, in Syria. But others are more inclined to view Russia as a potential threat, and they appear to favor a more uh, 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 a harder line toward um, um, Russia. So um, EU countries, especially those with histories of Soviet um, uh, domination, are particularly wary of, of Russia. Um, but over the last few years, we have seen sort of a mixed uh, view on this. Um, in Poland and some Central European members, for example, there's sort of a strong opposition to a proposed Russian gas pipeline project, the Nord Stream 2, which would also increase the amount of Russian gas delivered to Germany and to other parts of Europe via the Baltic Sea. Uh, um, I don't have time to go into some of the issues that uh, surround the Nord Stream 2, uh, but by and large, there is both uh, opposition as well as uh, support for the project. But what is important here to stress is that um, Brexit can be seen by some as a win for uh, Russia, potentially leading to a more accommodating uh, EU approach. So in some way, um, the Brexit situation is seen as an opportunity for us, the European Union, to engage with Russia more uh, substantively. Although the UK has been a staunch supporter of EU sanctions on Russia, um, it is not the only EU member, I should say former EU member now, to hold such views. Um, so in some way, the Brexit situation also complicates efforts to forge a unified common European stance uh, toward Russia. And in many ways that is uh, used uh, by Russia as providing more division, opening up the, the, the gaps and the rift between EU uh, member states um, so that Russia can um, intervene and uh, have its own influence. Uh, so, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I did, I would uh, point to several uh, future scenarios of where we are headed in the EU. Uh, and I think my next slide um, can show you uh, some of the four different scenarios. So what are those? First one is what I call the muddling through. The EU would largely continue to function as it currently does without any significant treaty changes or decision-making reforms and find some degree of common solution to crises such as those posed by migration uh, or terrorism. The EU would continue to pursue integration and common policies where it is possible, although doing so may become increasingly difficult. What I would call this muddling through is sort of the uh, status quo uh, position. Now, the second one is establishing a two-speed or perhaps even a multi-speed European Union. The EU would become a two-speed entity consisting of a strongly integrated group of core countries and a group of periphery countries. Um, a multi-speed variant could see further integration pursued by some member states in selected fields, such as European defense or Eurozone governance, and other EU members could choose to opt out. Uh, this is actually not unprecedented, um, as I have shown with a differentiated integration. So even though some skeptical voices say that this is going to provide the breakup of the EU, I really do not subscribe personally to that uh, view. I think a two-speed is in a way sort of implicit in uh, the uh, workings of the current uh, EU. Uh, some European policymakers suggest that such a multi-speed EU, in fact, already exists uh, with varying degrees of membership uh, in, uh, on a range of EU uh, initiatives. Now, the third, um, a model that I sort of see is a looser, more intergovernmental configuration. What is that going to look like? Well, further EU integration essentially would be put on hold and possibly even reversed in some areas with sovereignty on certain issues reclaimed by national capitals. And the more uh, parties that are uh, Eurosceptical and focused on uh, national uh, uh, a sense of, of national sovereignty, the more we have of those parties, the more uh, opportunities there will be for that model to emerge. This outcome may be most likely should reform-minded Eurosceptic parties come to power in EU, more EU countries. 
So looser structure may make it easier for the EU to expand to include countries such as Turkey, uh, for instance, one of the remaining as, um, uh, uh, aspirants in the Western Balkans, but perhaps even countries such as Georgia and uh, the Ukraine. And I know this is a little bit fanciful uh, given the current situation, but if we take a very long horizon, a long-term view, that is indeed possible. Nothing is impossible really in politics. Now, the fourth and final model that I uh, uh, prescribe is a tighter and more integrated configuration. The EU would emerge from its current challenges uh, as more unified, as more integrated. And I think such an outcome would actually be more likely as a result of Brexit. Uh, that is my personal view. This is the model that I think um, uh, we are more likely to see. Um, it would result in, an, uh, in, an, in a European Union of member states who are more aligned on the need for further political and economic um, integration. But uh, the flip side of that is that such a configuration would likely not encourage further EU um, enlargement. Um, and let me move on to my next point about uh, next slide of um, the where we are currently with um, the uh, member uh, states and um, in terms of enlargement. Uh, as you can see on the map, in 2002, the EU concluded concession, accession talks with the 10 countries that I stated earlier, eight of whom uh, were communist, former communist countries, in addition to Malta and uh, Cyprus. That expansion resulted in 2004 with all these 10 members increasing the EU membership to 25, subsequently to 27 with uh, Bulgaria and Romania in 2007 and Croatia bringing it up to uh, 28 in 2013, only to see down to 27 with uh, Brexit. Now, um, moving on to my next slide, um, I wanted to focus slightly on the main stage of, of EU accession policies, just kind of have those very much in front of us to kind of uh, see that this is a very um, um, uh, arduous process. It is uh, very um, uh, onerous on every candidate member state. Those go back to the Maastricht Treaty um, that every country that is going to apply for EU membership needs to subscribe to a set of European values. Those go back to 1993, the so-called Copenhagen uh, criteria. Um, growing up in Bulgaria, um, I recall very much the opening of each individual chapter um, of those uh, 30 uh, uh, some um, chapters and how uh, difficult um, it is. And, and that's what we kind of see currently, uh, this, the variation of um, European enlargement of existing um, states. Um, currently of the five countries that are currently official candidates for EU membership, four of those are in the Western Balkans. Um, I think I, my next slide will show that on the map. We have Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and Serbia. Turkey is also an official candidate, uh, but as we know, the this, this situation has almost been frozen uh, for some time. And all of these countries are in very different stages in their uh, accession process. On this map, I uh, show what that is. I wanted to spend a minute or so on some of the potential challenges to enlargement uh, into uh, the Western Balkan regions. I would say that Montenegro and Serbia are farthest along along among all the candidate countries in, formal, in the formal accession process. Although, sadly, I don't think either of these countries is expected to join the EU anytime uh, soon. In 2018, the European Commission stated that Montenegro and Serbia could potentially be ready for membership by 2025. Now that was three years ago, um, but they also cautioned that this target is extremely ambitious. Uh, and I think three years later, that sort of uh, pronouncement is uh, still very much uh, the case. Um, some have uh, expressed concern, and I think rightly so, over democracy backsliding, the rule of law. Um, in terms of formal progress, Montenegro is the, for, the front runner for EU membership. Montenegro has opened 33 of its accession negotiation chapters and has provisionally closed three of them, um, although, that closing uh, uh, appears in uh, uh, occurs in stages, um, and today Serbia is the candidate country that is farthest along uh, after Montenegro. 
it has opened 18 accession chapters uh, and two have been provisionally uh, closed. Obviously, um, and I imagine to many of us in this room uh, know of some of the complicating factors of why the Serbia membership uh, is going to be problematic. Um, now, the final, uh, a, a final comprehensive settlement between Kosovo and Serbia uh, remains sort of ever elusive. There's one step forward, one step backward, um, and that is going to be a challenging uh, moment for Serbia on its trajectory for EU uh, membership. Uh, Serbia's balancing approach to foreign relations has sometimes been a source of friction as well. In comparison, however, to other European countries, Serbia, I should say other European candidate countries, Serbia has a lower rate of alignment with EU foreign and security uh, policy. Um, in fact, even uh, polls suggest that even the average Serbian citizen is uh, um, uh, less uh, in favor of uh, joining the European uh, Union. Uh, but in comparison to other Western Balkan countries, support for EU membership um, is uh, significantly higher than what we see in uh, Serbia. Um, international democracy, anti-corruption watchdogs have also raised, um, I think, very valid concerns about the state of democracy and the rule of law in uh, Serbia. Um, as I mentioned, the four Western Balkan countries, including Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and Serbia, um, they seem to all of them to have more viable and more feasible path to EU membership than um, Turkey um, or potential candidates, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. However, there is uncertainty um, about the accession prospect and the timeframes of these uh, candidates. This uncertainty, stems in part from dynamics that are external to these countries. Um, they stem from EU uh, cracks uh, as, that I've been addressing. So what I call the enlargement fatigue, uh, it's not a term that I've invented, but it is sort of broadly a broad umbrella under which we can put all kinds of concerns that the EU uh, has. And I'm gonna address that in just a minute. Um, but also from controversial delays in opening accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia, uh, including a uh, major player in this, uh, my home country of Bulgaria, that has stalled accession talks with um, North Macedonia. Uh, some even assert that perceptions of dimming EU membership prospects may undercut reform momentum in the region and contribute to a geopolitical power vacuum. And I personally subscribe to that view that the more we prolong, protract that moment uh, for many, uh, uh, EU um, candidate countries, the more we can see backsliding on uh, reforms. So the final point I wanted to make, um, and this would be, I believe my uh, last slide, um, or maybe the, one of the last two slides is enlargement fatigue. So what do we mean by that? And I wanted to um, have three broad sort of categories uh, or four of them, I suppose. The, despite EU's commitment to continued EU enlargement, especially to the Western Balkans, a number of European leaders and many EU citizens, in fact, remain deeply skeptical of further expansion of the bloc. They're apprehensive um, and there is declining enthusiasm among them, um, especially when it comes to uh, Turkey or even the Eastern partnership countries, including Georgia, uh, 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 the country uh, Georgia. Some of the factors that I want to highlight include the rule of law, labor migration, balance of power within the EU itself, and what I kind of loosely call EU identity. And let me go over each one of those briefly. The rule of law concerns. Doubts persist about the ability of some potential EU aspirants to implement EU standards, especially in areas related to the rule of law, fundamental rights, and anti-corruption measures. And I think the current EU members, Romania and Bulgaria, who have been members for the last 14 years, are a good sort of illustration of uh, what could happen when those reforms have, had not, had not been fully implemented. Recent assessment from such international non-governmental uh, organizations, including Freedom House, Transparency International, have in fact added more concern to this democratic backsliding and ongoing corruption uh, in these, uh, some of these candidate countries. Moreover, some states, including current EU states, including uh, Poland and Hungary, um, have 
added fuel to kind of curbing that enthusiasm for further enlargement. In other words, why should we accept more EU members if the other members that we uh, took in 2004 have backslided on um, their rule of law um, and in fact have um, compromised the membership in the EU? The second um, factor I wanted to highlight is labor migration, because some policymakers within the EU have worried that the addition of other countries with very weak economies and lower income could actually lead to a significant influx of low costs um, or even unwanted migrant labor. Uh, some of that happened with the accession of Bulgaria and Romania, but also with Poland, um, as we all remember the Pol Polish plumber in the streets of London. But I think largely uh, these are misperceived fears, although we have to combat them because they're very prevalent at the level of the average EU um, uh, citizen. Um, and let me also turn uh, to the third factor, which is the balance of power within the EU um, and how that uh, impacts policymaking. A key EU member states, uh, in fact, fear that an ever expanding union could ultimately weaken their ability to set the tone and the agenda in EU institutions um, because of what we have seen since 2004, um, when the EU enlargement brought in a more diverse group of member states with various interests and different policy preferences. As a result, EU enlargement may have made reaching consensus on or speaking with one voice on certain issues. And I've already alluded to some of that. <clears throat> Um, from migration to energy policy, to relations with Russia, relations with China, it gets harder and harder to have to speak in a single voice. Um, and that is a real concern. So expanding the member states um, uh, to uh, more would um, certainly uh, lead to more complications. And the fourth one is EU identity, which I find um, sort of as a loose concern. And frankly, that would be the uh, concern in, especially in those countries with a very large Eurosceptic uh, presence and uh, political parties that have emerged. Um, I, don't, I don't think that is a real concern, but what I do think it needs to happen is for the EU itself to formulate a way for EU citizens to uh, feel more connected and to feel more integrated in a very large uh, sort of what many would say bureaucratic um, machine and bureaucratic entity. So the more the EU tries to integrate um, citizens on a very active citizen level, uh, the more it would accomplish that uh, goal of integrating a wide variety of um, uh, citizens. So my final point, and uh, we can turn to the last slide um, to kind of um, uh, to share with you um, what I've been trying to show in my uh, presentation is, I do think we are, are at a unique problem uh, process. We are at a unique moment currently within the European Union. There are many challenges ahead, uh, but I'm firmly of the belief that those challenges are also great opportunities. What we're going to make with those is up to the European Union. Um, external threats continue to exist, uh, but I do think those can provide viable uh, possibilities um, for further strengthening of the European Union. At the same time, I am not trying to paint a rosy picture. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, nothing is impossible in politics. I don't think the European Union is um, precisely that entity that is going to uh, never be challenged or that it will uh, um, stay the same way, um, just as with all kinds of uh, political uh, integration processes, this is going to be uh, taking a long time. It may kind of backslide while it makes progress. Um, that is inevitable. But if we were to take a very long view, and I think of several generations ahead of us, I am hopeful that the European Union is going to uh, remain as strong. But those challenges need to be um, reckoned with and to be dealt with in a way that is going to be far more transparent. Um, and I think uh, the question of transparency is one the EU can uh, further um, strengthen. So in conclusion, um, I do want to suggest that um, there is no other future, at least for the moment, uh, for any of those EU countries, um, and especially for those in Eastern Europe. Um, so 
the more we focus on what the future is going to bring, uh, the more we need to focus on what we can do uh, here and now. And I think um, my final point is that the engagement of EU citizens in this process is the way to move forward, as opposed to uh, continuing to create this uh, two speed, if you will, between EU um, elite uh, policymaking versus the average citizen of uh, the EU. The more we bridge that gap, the more we can hope to have a more um, uh, transparent process of European Union um, integration. So let me pause here. Uh, I do thank you for your attention and I'm happy to open it up for a uh, question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and I would say also informative uh, lecture. And uh, now uh, we are open to questions and you should raise your hand and I'm going to give you the word. Yes, we already have the first question from Martin Stoyo. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, you mentioned about the uh, European Defense or Security Organization. Uh, what would that mean about the relations with NATO? Uh, and uh, are European countries going to change their ties with the North Atlantic uh, Pact uh, somehow? Thank you. Yes, Thanks. that's a, a great question. And by the way, is this the question that is in the chat room? Uh, no, that's another question which uh, I, uh, by mistake, um, put there, but uh, I'm going to ask it later. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, the question of NATO uh, expansion and the EU, um, it is a very fraught question. Um, and I imagine those of you uh, who know Russia in a, in, in a kind of uh, much more immediate uh, way than I do um, will relate to some of the challenges that European, sorry, that uh, NATO expansion uh, poses to uh, our neighbor, uh, Russia. Um, I do think that some of the, let me put it this way, some of the concerns that Russia brings up um, in how it has dealt with, how the European Union has dealt with NATO expansion in the early 2000s is valid. And I think we need to recognize that. Um, some people go as far as to say that the Russian leadership, uh, especially with Vladimir Putin, should have been far more involved in this process and certain promises made. At the same time, what we hear within the EU is even NATO accession for countries such as Ukraine. Uh, or even Georgia for that matter. I don't think those kinds of um, what I would call rhetoric at this point in time is helpful for the EU. Why? Because it really provides space for exacerbation and for it gives reasons for Russia to feel um, threatened. Um, and I think those reasons are valid for Russia to feel threatened. So how do we move forward? Um, in some way, the NATO expansion is not only a military project, but it's also a military project that leads to political uh, changes and political reform. Uh, and it is not incidental that every single country or almost every single country that is part of NATO is also a part of the EU. Um, with obviously with um, uh, important exceptions in the North, in the Nordic countries. Um, but currently, as we see with North Macedonia and its accession to NATO, is seen as a prelude for political uh, accession within the EU. So I think the bottom line is what the EU may, uh, uh, or perhaps what it could gain, it, what it could do is to, um, to lower the temperature in its rhetoric for NATO expansion um, and to focus less on um, what is Article uh, 5 going to do for us in the context of Ukraine, but more to focus on how the NATO expansion can be strengthened by going back to uh, another ally, which is the United States. And by the way, I had a whole section on the US that I didn't have time to go into, but I find the United States very vital in this NATO process uh, because of the challenges that we have been seeing during the Trump administration and some of the language that came out of that um, because NATO needs to reformulate its purpose. I think that's where part of the problem is. NATO is no longer a, uh, an entity that is seen as the opposition uh, to the Warsaw Pact. NATO should take on a different, uh, a different mission. It should embrace a different vision for what it is. Um, so I do think it's time for NATO to also 
internally formulate uh, a way to move forward? How can we envision uh, uh, our uh, alliance, which is the strongest alliance that has existed, military alliance in, in world history? Um, that is important to, to note. Um, but also not to exacerbate Russia. Um, I do know that, for instance, Russia has not helped uh, us move in that direction. In fact, I believe they closed their NATO uh, office, um, and that has provided more room for uh, potential disagreements and potential mistakes um, that I think need to be avoided. At the same time, I am hopeful that during the uh, Biden administration, there has been more recognition of how to engage with our NATO allies. Um, so the bottom line is, one, we need a different vision, mission, um, and a different reconfiguration of what this military alliance is going to look like. And two, to kind of lower the temperature and the rhetoric um, that we have uh, towards Russia. Okay, thank you. And uh, can I ask my second question? I was interested about the difference between the European Union and organizations such as ASEAN, which are pretty familiar, but uh, not to the extent of uh, the um, European Union. Can you um, distinguish uh, the difference, differences and uh, yeah, explain a little bit? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and this is sort of very dear to my heart because part of my own sort of interest is what kinds of political arrangements should we have for ourselves? Uh, even though national sovereignty is what we know and we're most familiar with throughout human history, uh, it, we haven't had the uh, national sovereignty states in existence. So this is a very new phenomenon. So focusing on uh, the European Union, on uh, ASEAN as another um, uh, structure of federated organization, points to the fact that there are alternatives to the national sovereignty model. But those alternatives vary tremendously. Obviously, the European Union is not only the most successful, for the time being at least, but it is also the most advanced. Some people go as far as to say that, um, for, instance, for instance, in fact, there is someone, um, her name is uh, Professor Stella uh, uh, Garvis, and she's a visiting professor at your own school. Um, I think uh, she's based at the University of Birmingham. So she's just visiting uh, for the year. Um, and I believe she's based in the St. Petersburg campus. But the reason why I bring her up is in her own research, she points to the evolution of these um, uh, federal structures, including NATO, uh, sorry, including uh, the European Union and others that have their origin story in the 18th century. Um, so she's very keen to show that the reason why these federated structures uh, begin to emerge is because of uh, uh, possibilities for peace. So in many ways, that is NATO, uh, but it is less the case with two other organizations that you bring up. One is um, ASEAN, and the other one is the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, I believe in terms of the, Euro the Eurasian Economic Union, um, you perhaps uh, more of experts than I am on this topic, but as far as I know, it is more a union on paper than a union in the same way or even a similar way as the European Union. Because what is fundamental to European Union integration is the what we call the pooling of sovereignty, where every member is sovereign, but at the same time we have intergovernmental structures. Uh, I pointed to some of those uh, core um, uh, 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 entities within the EU. Um, and there is political and economic influence. Uh, in a way that we do not see with your, your with the ASEAN and the um, uh, Eurasian Economic um, uh, Union. So even though in name, th both ASEAN and European Eurasian Economic Union are unions, um, they don't have the political uh, or economic clout. Now, in the case of ASEAN, you can remove members uh, from its governing body. In fact, that's what they did. Um, recently with uh, Myanmar or Burma, former Burma. Um, but that in a way is very much a political act. So what did the Burmese or the Myanmar do? Well, what they did is they uh, responded by uh, freeing some of their uh, political prisoners and to suggest that we actually, we're a good member and now we can go back to ASEAN. So I think that kind of 
um, gesturing that you can be a part of our political body, but what does that political body do? It's largely sort of uh, economic trade uh, body, but not even in a way that the European Union um, uh, is. I do think what makes Eurasian Economic Union and ASEAN what I would call categorically different from the European Union is the core commitment to a set of values and principles. Now, we may not uphold these values and principles at all times. And obviously, uh, in politics, as we know, realism is very much at the core as opposed to some kind of moral values. But I do think that what the European Union does is it has both the carrot and the stick, as they say, at the same time. So no one is forcing, or I should say nobody forced Bulgaria to join the EU. Um, nobody forced Romania to join the EU. Uh, but the economic um, uh, um, uh, enticement, the economic desire to become part of a large economic bloc um, is so important that even the political membership that many people might have some difficulties with uh, should be compromised uh, at the expense of the economic benefits. So everyone is a beneficiary uh, in a very sort of fundamental way um, that we don't see in the same way with the Eurasian Economic Union or ASEAN. Um, and I don't think that um, at, at this point in time, I just don't see what might be some of the core values that would bring either of these two, ASEAN or your Eurasian Economic Union, into some kind of cohesive, uh, long-term sustaining body. Yeah, it, it is there on paper. There are certain meetings between their leaders, but by and large, how does the average citizen in any of these countries uh, feel? Are they, uh, if you ask the average Burmese, or uh, someone in Myanmar, are you a member of ASEAN? They will say, what are you talking about as an average citizen? In a way that I think when the EU citizen goes to vote for European parliament, even though that's a very low number, I mean, it's still in the 20, 30%, still you have the opportunity to exercise your vote and to feel more connected to the core institutions of what we call a single union. Um, so I think bottom line is, uh, the Eurasian and Economic Union and ASEAN are largely more on paper, and they serve purposes other than those that the EU uh, does. Uh, thank you very much. We have oh, five more questions. I think the first one who raised her hand was Beatrice. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Christoph, uh, for your very informative report. I will, I will allow myself to bring you back to NATO. Uh, my question is, um, what about the connection uh, between NATO and EU? I mean, uh, to be more, more precise about the perception of the so-called concept of Euro-Atlanticism among some of the EU countries, including Bulgaria, that uh, quite openly state um, that being a member of both NATO and EU is basically the same thing. And can we call this um, some kind of a, a part of the EU identity or is just uh, maybe some rhetorical propaganda in order to exacerbate relationship with Russia? And yeah, this is my question. What does the uh, Euro Atlanticism mean to to the EU countries at this moment? Thank you, Beatrice. It's a wonderful question. Um, when we speak of Euro Atlanticism, I'm, I'm reminded of, of our Bulgarian Solomon Passi um, and bringing in the NATO leadership in Sofia and writing them in the Trabi uh, as kind of an example of how far we have come. Um, but I do think your point that equivocation, if you will, um, between the purpose of NATO and the purpose of the EU, in many ways, at least for the average citizen, seem to be kind of conflated and they're almost identical. So when we speak of Euro-Atlanticism, there isn't that kind of uh, distinction. Um, I think part of it is because both NATO and European Union, a military and a political slash economic project uh, seem to have a, to share a set of core principles, um, including uh, the idea of pulling uh, their sovereignty or defending members uh, with Article 5 um, that 
um, um, uh, att an attack on one member is an attack on the uh, entire alliance. Um, so that um, um, conjoining, if you will, of NATO uh, on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand, does not, I think, help um, the largest neighbor uh, to our east, uh, which is uh, Russia. Um, and I think what one way for us to, uh, that I mentioned already is to tone down the rhetoric, to lower the temperature. Um, and I think that can be done uh, in multiple different ways. Um, again, part of the issue that I have with the current um, shape that the NATO has is what is its purpose? Yes, it is a military alliance, but what kind of military alliance? Because we have a, a NATO member, including Turkey, that over the last 15 years or so has been backsliding on democracy, for instance. Um, so obviously the political uh, system is not necessarily a prerequisite for membership in NATO, but it is very much a prerequisite for membership in the EU. Um, so trying to clarify what those differences are would also help us um, um, divide, or I should say, sort of um, look at uh, this Euro-Atlanticism as kind of two sides of the same coin. It's a military alliance on the one hand, but the EU is a political um, and economic um, alliance. Um, and I think, frankly, also at the domestic level, there's a lot of rhetoric that helps certain, especially your skeptic uh, parties, to make an argument that, look, it's all about your Atlanticism. And we can put, as they say, uh, all your eggs in one basket. So we can put the NATO, we can put uh, the EU. It's all the same. It's all about kind of trying to dictate uh, how we should uh, lead our own lives. And I think a lot of um, um, uh, Euroskeptical uh, parties within the EU um, kind of tend to do that. But also let's not forget that even France, which is a full, fully fledged member of the European Union, has distinct relations to NATO. Now, obviously those changed during somewhat during the presidency of Manuel Macron, but by and large, um, it is not equal with uh, in terms of its own membership as uh, other NATO members. So we also need to be mindful of that sort of differentiation of membership uh, that exists both in the EU and uh, NATO. Thank you very much. We have uh, four more questions. Um, Peter Tanev. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I'm just wondering uh, that we, we have we had so many professors and analytics uh, that say and mention that the European army and the project of European army is literally necessary, uh, unnecessary things. And for example, I have diff I had different kind of conversations with European diplomats from European Union mission to Russia when I had the internship in this institution. And they said, like, it's a necessary thing. We have NATO alliance, et cetera, et cetera. And what we can see after a couple of years, as we say, as time was born, a uh, humanitarian uh, crisis that was organized by Lukashenko regimes, different kind of th threats. So, uh, uh, what what do you think? Uh, do you think that the holding of, for example, of the first joint military exercises of the European Union countries in 2023 will become kind a precedent for the implementation of the Defence Union already? Because the Defence Union was the agenda in the so-called trilogue between the predominant institutions of EU. Uh, so could it be kind of precedence? into European Union legislation as one of the final steps to comprehensive European integration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, for your question. I think this is a very sticking point, uh, not only in the European Union, but also in the US. Um, and let me just address the US part because I think it's related to the EU part. Um, over the last five, six years, what we did see uh, on this side of the Atlantic is that the US is uh, very much kind of sharing the burden, uh, uh, if not financially, at least to a large degree militarily, of um, that NATO alliance. And 
what we have on paper, uh, sort of the 2% of GDP being spent on military defense by each member, EU member state, um, there's a lot of variation uh, within that. Um, so part of the reason why the EU, sorry, the United States and the Trump presidency was so insistent on seeing the kind of the transactional nature of NATO, as opposed to the kind of one of the intrinsic values that such a military alliance brings, there is a, a valid kind of point to that. Um, because there isn't a strong motivation by the EU European Union institutions to kind of help each of the member states to reach to their uh, expected um, uh, uh, proportion of GDP to defense uh, budget. So I think that is sort of the first problem, um, how the EU can enforce uh, and establish a mechanism where that can those budget uh, uh, defense budget uh, needs can be met on country by country uh, case, uh, but I think that your that uh, U.S. opposition has fueled in more resentment within the EU of what is this kind of transatlantic going back to kind of Beatrice's point earlier. How should we view that partnership between the United States and uh, the European Union? Uh, and I think the question of, are we gonna have a standing army um, um, or are we going to abolish armies? Um, that kind of debate is not to me at least very helpful. Um, there's no way in which uh, we're going to abolish our military budget. There is no way for us to uh, um, uh, even, even lower our military budget uh, given some of the conflicts um, that um, we're currently um, uh, facing. But what is going to problematize relations between NATO and Russia is some of these joint military exercises. For example, we've seen those in the Black Sea. Uh, we have seen uh, American presence in Bulgaria and Romania, and those kinds of new um, uh, uh, military exercises do provide room for um, uh, new challenges um, coming um, from Russia. Um, so, Places like the Black Sea, uh, for example, um, that include countries including Russia, Georgia, Bulgaria, and Romania, might be those kind of areas uh, where you can sort of see almost a spectacle evolving of that sort of uh, EU um, and NATO uh, 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 sort of uh, confrontation with Russia. Um, so I don't think that we are at a moment where the military uh, uh, that armies are going to be abolished. I don't think we're at a moment where our military budget should be uh, lowered, but I do think it is time for the European Union to establish common grounds for their military defense. The outgoing uh, Chancellor Merkel has indicated that the way we have, that the way that the European Union has traditionally looked at the United States, namely as, um, as, as, as uh, the party of, of providing the most security, the most defense, the most budget uh, to NATO should no longer be taken for granted. And I do think uh, that I subscribe to her position that the United States more and more seems to feel preoccupied with its domestic agenda. And as a result, we are seeing this kind of uh, not complacency necessarily, but certain kind of withdrawal of, of the United States from that kind of NATO vision. So the EU has to come uh, together and speak in one voice. Part of the problem is that it involves money. And when there's money involved, it's hard to kind of have a conversation uh, uh, with all these kind of different European Union members. Um, but no kind of defense union, I don't think, uh, separate from NATO is going to be, at least in the short term, established um, because I don't think you will find much support uh, for that, both for uh, financial reasons but also I think for political reasons. Um, but I, I think my final point is how to engage Russia with this uh, because the European Union and NATO uh, leadership have not engaged Russia, I think productively. So some of the valid concerns that I think Russia brings up could be mitigated, they could be ameliorated precisely by providing a more dialogical uh, level of conversation and talks with Russia. Um, so that's kind of where I see things going forward. 
Thank you very much. We have two more questions. I will just ask you to ask them a little bit more shorter. Uh, Wood, how on? Uh, yes, I just want to add uh, my opinion for the first question. When Martin asked about like uh, what is the difference between uh, uh, ASEAN and uh, Europe? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, um, yes, sir. Uh, Europe, European Union. Yes. Uh, sorry, just mix Russian and English. Yeah, I think I'm, as the migrants from the ASEAN, I think the most difference about that is about that our history and target is different. And at that time when they created the Euro European Union, uh, they are a developed country, but when we are created, when we are creating, uh, when we created uh, Asian, uh, all country was developing. So I think that's the most uh, difference. And uh, uh, our target, like in the uh, region, our target is not the same, not the same because uh, like in my country, we have this, uh, different points about uh, South, Southeast China, China Sea and the, uh, other countries has difference. And yes, my question, uh, like uh, if uh, Eastern uh, European country join uh, European Union in the future, what uh, the relation between those country and Russian will be changed and uh, you think it will be better or worse? I just wondering. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful question. I'm glad you brought up uh, brought us back to ASEAN. Um, I think part of the challenge um, for the Western Balkans that I mentioned is the former uh, Russian influence in those parts of Europe um, in a way that is going to challenge their further um, accession into the European Union. Um, the most uh, um, a challenging case, I think, is going to be Serbia. Um, uh, at least of the six uh, current uh, candidate countries. Um, so taking the historical sort of overview of is, for instance, Serbia uh, going to join uh, the European Union? Um, I think we need to be very sensitive to that history in a way that I don't think the EU is as sensitive to that history. Uh, my also hope for Northern Macedonia is uh, in, its com in, in its sort of um, uh, how the accession process has been blocked by uh, my home country of Bulgaria um, is going at, at least one positive outcome of that development, I hope, is to make sure that the EU is aware of that historical, um, that, that history is brought into the European Union with every accession. Um, and in that sense, we need to be mindful of what that history is. So. To answer your question, what is that kind of future in relation to Russia? Um, rather than seeing the expansion of the European Union in the Western Balkans as a threat to Russia, I think the emphasis could be on the economic integration um, and what that is going to do, um, as opposed to a political move where the European Union is kind of pulling the Western Balkans away from Russian influence. Uh, uh, so I think that's sort of one way in which you can mitigate sort of uh, the Russian, uh, the concern that they have uh, for European Union um, expansion. Um, so yeah, so I'll just focus on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we have one more question from the audience from Jan Dalmo. So much for your presentation and your time it was really, really interesting. Um, so I would like to ask about Turkey more deeply, since the accession process started much earlier and despite the efforts of Turkey, there are many countries of the European Union that are against it. So I would like to, to ask about these main countries that are opposed to Turkey's uh, Turkish uh, accession. Why for, ex why, for example, um, France is possibly the country most opposed to the accession of Turkey or one of the most opposed. And we have seen from my point of view, how uh, President Macron is always kind of putting off uh, for accession to happen, to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. Um, 
I think, you, yes, absolutely, that um, Turkey has been in the accession queue, so to speak, for a very long time. Um, and unfortunately, um, we have seen sort of very different uh, perceptions of should we, should we not allow Turkey into the European Union. Um, in my view, um, the determination, the decision whether to accept Turkey or not in the European Union, in many ways is no longer about Turkey as a candidate country. And it's more about what can Turkey as a candidate country do for our domestic politics? And I think in this context, your bringing up of uh, France is extremely pertinent because as we know, Islam uh, and how that is being sort of perceived um, uh, within France uh, is important. Um, especially when it comes to the one thing we have not even discussed at all is the long legacy of imperial and colonial practices of Europe. You cannot separate that uh, from what is happening today in France and its um, uh, opposition, frankly, to Islam and how they sort of conflate Islam with Turkey because there's more to Turkey than Islam, obviously. Um, in fact, NATO, uh, as in, uh, Turkey has been a NATO uh, member uh, in many ways, a very sort of um, committed member for many, many decades um, in ways that that needs to be recognized. So I think this all serves domestic purposes. Um, and um, at the same time, what doesn't help the situation in Turkey right now is sort of the, the, the long um, series of um, political backsliding, if you will. Um, if you compare Turkey in 2010 to Turkey in 2021, one can see very significant uh, backsliding and that just doesn't help the situation. I think what someone like Macron does is play off on the sentiments within his domestic kind of um, uh, uh, audience and to suggest that Turkey is not ready because uh, Islam uh, is going to come into Europe and we need to kind of fight that. Um, there is kind of a very interesting kind of historical and I'm, I have no time to address it, but this kind of uh, opposition which has very deep roots in Europe to Islam and how Turkey is conflated with that, within that kind of discourse in a way that we don't see as much in a country like uh, Kosovo, uh, which is also predominantly, or Albania, predominantly um, is uh, Muslim. Uh, but we see that so much prevalence in Turkey, um, in the case of Turkey. Uh, so all of this is playing off uh, domestic politics, um, I think. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe I'm going to ask the last question as a moderator. Well, uh, I have recently uh, read Huntington's book, uh, Who Are We?, where he argues uh, that the American nation was born after the, the bloody civil war. And um, if we can make something like a par parallel, uh, does Europe need a conflict or at least a crisis of this uh, magnitude to form something like an uh, European, European nation, European uh, identity, if you want? And can we say that the uh, European Union is coming out even more um, co cohesive after the, the pandemic? Thank you so much for that question. Oh, yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, um, who are we? Um, Huntington's thesis that we need sort of um, an external factor to kind of bring us in together uh, and formulate and shape a single identity uh, that we can all subscribe to um, is not an argument that I personally subscribe to. I have difficulties with that argument uh, myself. I even have more difficulties applying that Huntington argument to the European Union um, context. Um, I think what we need to do is to focus not on a single external threat and how that can shape an internal uh, European Union identity, whatever that identity is going to look like, but more to focus on how every single um, external conflict um, whether it is uh, um, the uh, uh, pandemic, whether it is the migration uh, conflict and so on, how each of these conflicts can serve as uh, an opportunity uh, for us because conflicts are not going to disappear from world politics. They're always going to be there. The question is, what do we make with them? Um, and I think the uh, establishing sort of a common European identity, I actually think that it can backfire more than it can help uh, the European Union project. Um, I think what needs to happen is 
to make uh, the process itself of European Union integration more transparent. And I think um, identity, if what we mean by ident identity is participation in elections um, um, and more transparency in the process itself, to me, that's what uh, how we should tie European identity um, as opposed to kind of an enforced external mechanism where everybody sort of adopts European identity or whatever that looks like. Um, every single country in Europe has a, a history of war, a history of domination. Trying to emphasize those is not going to help the process, but trying to create new habits of how each of those citizens can feel part of a process that directly affects them is, I think, uh, what is going to provide us with a sense of who we are as Europeans. Um, and let me just end on this kind of one note. Who is Europe? Um, Europe lives in our imagination in many ways. Europa, from where we take the, the word Europe, is a mythological figure. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Europe is a myth, but that's where its origin is. And I think what we need to focus on is on the political and economic dimension of what this is gonna look like. So our identity is very much derived from um, these processes. Um, and I think that's where we need to focus on as opposed to some kind of um, identity that comes from a single uh, external uh, threat. Um, so um, that's where I'm gonna pause, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I want especially to thank you for um, for for making this lecture for us, uh, it was a really great great ple pleasure to to host and to host you and talk about the the European Union. And I think that I'm talking from uh, as, as as well as uh, the others that it was a very interesting uh, gathering. And thank you all for participating and of course for your questions. Uh, I hope to see you soon on our second seminar that is going to be after uh, several weeks. And uh, with this note, I think we can uh, end our gathering today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, feel free to also follow up with me. I'm happy to entertain any kind of correspondence with any one of you. Um, and thank you so much for everyone um, for your wonderful questions. And I wish you the best of luck in your studies um, and in all of your future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.